Okay, let's start. So welcome everyone. So today we are really pleased to, uh, to host uh, Sébastien Cartier uh, for this talk about uh, how can the movement of grains be linked to geomorphological transport flows on long time scales. So Sébastien is a researcher at the uh, Institut de Recherche pour le Développement uh, in Toulouse. He's currently in a uh, one month stay in, uh, in Peru. I just told us that he has a bit of uh, unstable Wi-Fi connection, so we might have some issues during the talk. We'll see. Could be uh, the surprise. Uh, we will uh, chair this uh, seminar together with Boris uh, Gaiton and Steffi Tofelde. Um, so we will deactivate the chat during the uh, course of the um, of the seminar, and we will activate it at the end so that you can ask directly your question in the chat. You also have the option to uh, raise your hand and we will give you um, uh, the right to use your mic to directly ask a question to, to Sebastian. And just before we start, just a small announcement. We are currently looking for uh, new members to join the team of, of Landscape Live for next year. And we are also looking for uh, potential speakers, especially uh, PhD students or postdocs. So please do not hesitate to uh, Uh, to ask us about uh, either becoming a member or if you want to give a talk as well, uh, please contact us. So yeah, we are really happy to, uh, to have uh, Sébastien for this talk. So Sébastien, I will uh, let you the, uh, the floor. So, yeah, thank you and, and hello everybody. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me for, for this uh, talk and, and for organizing that. Uh, it's really a pleasure to to be able to look and to watch these, uh, these presentations. And um, what I'm going to present, obviously I'm not alone, so I, I have a list here of uh, my co-authors of the papers I, I will uh, present you uh, next. And uh, so I, I'm, today I'm going to try to, to show or to, to, to see how to, to link the movement of grains that can be measured on the field and geomorphological transport laws that are used Uh, in landscape evolution model, for example. And this question um, uh, is linked to a very uh, common uh, question and problem in, in sedimentology or geomorphology. Uh, when, a pulse, when a sediment pulse arises from a tectonic or climatic events, uh, this pulse is transferred to sedimentary basins. And here, the sediment, sedimentary archives uh, are fundamental records for, for these events. But because uh, it takes time to transfer sediment pulse toward the basins, and because sediment pulse spreads downstream, uh, it may be difficult to interpret uh, sedimentary archives. And so for that, we, we need models that can help us to, to discriminate between uh, events in time or, or the cause of, of this uh, uh, archive. Um, and The big question, so, is how to model uh, sediment transfer over long time scales. And this question is somehow re related with the previous speeches we, we had uh, in this landscape live for, from uh, Laura Creek, for example, or Anne, uh, next, the last one. So, what people do usually is to consider that sediment transfer over long time scale is a diffusive process. And this diffusive process means that the sediment flux. QS is proportional to the local slope. And D, the diffusivity, uh, is a measurement of the rate of, trans of, of, spread, of spreading, and it can depend on a local water discharge or grain size. And combining this geomorphological transport law with the mass balance equation, where Z here is the elevation of, uh, of a river, for example, you can model at the same time the evolution of the, the elevation of the basins and the sediment flux through uh, and towards the basins. And this has been the basis for, for many papers, uh, starting from the pioneer paper of, of Paola, uh, I recommend to read. And uh, the, the point is, it's quite difficult to, to justify these laws or, or to, to calibrate these laws, and, uh, and we have few data for that. What, what we do have in terms of dynamic of sediment transport is the grains that are moved uh, in rivers in particular, And maybe analyzing the movement of grains, we may be able to justify or to calibrate these loads. The problem is the grains transport is highly complicated. Uh, it involves period at rest, period of movement, recycling of all deposits, et cetera, et cetera. 
So the challenge is to, to link uh, the long-term grain movements and these geomorphic, geomorphic transport laws. And this is what I'm going to try to, to do in the, in the next. So um, I will begin with a quite long, I'm afraid, recall uh, about grain transport uh, statistics and, and statistics, uh, statistical physics, or at least what I understood from that, and geomorphological transport laws used in simplified uh, long-term models. Then I will give an example of what we did uh, by tracking uh, using a, a geochemistry method, uh, tracking the long-term spreading of pebbles in an Andean river in Chile. Uh, I will emphasize the role of grains that do not move uh, at the scale of a wall of Piedmont. And I will finish by giving some suggestions about uh, the possible ways of linking grain tracking when we can do uh, over the long-term and long-term models. So previous work. We do actually have a theoretical, uh, uh, we have a theory to link what we can measure uh, uh, on the field and, and the geomorphological transport law. Uh, imagine you can track uh, the movement of a population of grains in a river. Uh, you, might, you, you might observe that this initial population of, grain, of grains is uh, advected at the rate mu, and it can also spread downstream and the spreading, the, the increase of distances between grains, is characterized by the stand, standard deviation sigma. Uh, and um, from these two parameters, you can uh, calculate QS. You can write what QS is. And again, combining QS with the mass balance equation, you, you end up with a classical advection diffusion equation, where the evolution of the elevation of the river elevation here is linked to uh, this advection term and the diffusion term. I don't, I don't want to emphasize too much the math here. The, the important point is that it's possible to link D, the diffusivity, with what you can measure on the field, the standard, standard deviations of grains distances. And we know that uh, since Einstein, actually, we know that uh, in case of a diffusion process, the standard deviation sigma is scales with the square root of the diffusivity and time. So if you put uh, your measurement of grain distances through time in a, in a diagram where you have standard deviation in y-axis and the time in the x-axis in a log-log plot, you get a line and the slope of this line is 0.5. If, if this is a diffusive process, you have a slope of 0.5. Uh, the problem with that is that if this holds only uh, if you don't have grains that travel very large distances during a transport event. And I will illustrate this here. You can also write QS, the sediment flux at, at one location, as the sum of grain sizes multiplied by the distribution of velocities of grains. If you have grains traveling uh, very fast, VE here is a mean velocity, it's a virtual velocity, including period at rest or period in movement. Then the, the long-term QS you can estimate here uh, do not depend, does not depend only on the local factors like local slope or, or what local water discharge. It also depends on the upstream topography. And this is what is called non-local, non-locality. And in that case, diffusion may not be a good model. This uh, phenomena has been emphasized in, in, in recent papers um, that, that, that gave a, a very strong uh, basis for, for analyzing these cases. Well, the good point is we, we, we can identify if we have diffusion or, or anomalous diffusion in a river. Again, if you are able to track grains from a, from a, from a location to another and to look at their distances or how these distances increase uh, through time. Um, again, in this same diagram of uh, standard deviation through time in log-log. So as I told before, if you have an open five slope, it's diffusion. If you have a higher slope, it's called super diffusion. It means that the spreading is larger than predicted by simple diffusion. If you have a smaller slope, it's called sub diffusion. It means that the spreading is smaller than predicted by diffusion. And you can read this paper, which is very informative about what could be uh, this behavior depending on the scale of observation of grains movement in a river. Um, and we know also that sigma 
the standard deviations depend on the two states that can have a clast in a, in a river. Uh, the, the state that corresponds to rest when clasts are, are not moving. Uh, and for that, you have a distribution, uh, obviously, of time uh, at rest, T. And we have also a distribution of travel distances, which is the second state that have a class, so when it moves. And, and depending on the form of this distribution, the, the probability distribution function here, PDF, um, you may have a long or heavy tail to these distributions. It, it means that if the tail is long, is very long or heavy, it means that you have a significant probability of having class staying for a long time in, a, in, a, in the river, so with long resting time, or uh, having very long travel distance. And depending on this tail here, uh, we know that we, we can predict either subdiffusion or superdiffusion uh, depending, depending on this, on this tail in, in both, in both uh, statistics here. And again, this paper gave a very comprehensive analysis of all the situations that could, uh, could uh, end up with the anomalous diffusion. Um, so uh, obviously people try to, uh, to measure uh, the gravel distances uh, on the field using magnetic, tra uh, magnetic uh, trackers or, or painting pebbles. And they, they tracked uh, these pebbles over time scales of up to several years and up to several kilometers in, in, in rivers. Um, but also they did that in, in, in flume experiments where they could um, see, analyze the statistics of uh, periods um, at rest and period of, of grains uh, travel. And it seems that from, this, in the lab, from these uh, studies, it seems that super diffusion emerged from heavy tail distribution of resting time. So it seems that the, the statistics of, of resting times control a lot the behavior of, and it means it leads to super diffusion and also probably to the fact that you have not only one grain size, but a, a mixture of different grain sizes that may have different probability to be transported at different distances. And again, again, we have a bunch of, of papers that emphasize the, these phenomena and I, I, they are very instructive. So all these studies are based on very clean uh, statistical physics uh, 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 also uh, can also be linked to um, a, a generalization of uh, the relationship between what we can measure in case of anomalous diffusion and the geomorphic transport law. Uh, and this is called fractional derivative. This is a kind of, of mathematical monster. Again, I don't want to emphasize that here. There are clever people able to solve the, this kind of equation, but it simply uh, says that if you have phi equal to one here, you get the classical diffusion. If phi is different from one, you have another way of calculating QS. Uh, and the, the, the important point here is that you can still uh, know what phi is from the measurement on the field of grain statistics. And for example, if you, have, if you combine both statistics at rest and moving, you can have a, a distribution for mean transport distances. And the exponents of the distribution here, if it corresponds to a poor law, is the fee of the, of the fractional uh, der derivative. So we know that uh, it predicts different behavior in terms of sediment flux, uh, profile, river profile, elevations, etc., than diffusion. Um, but the, the problem, and then again, th these are very clean, uh, uh, clean theories uh, and uh, very impressive. Um, but they, they, they correspond to only a small portion of, uh, of the sedimentary system we, we want to analyze in, in, in geology, let's say. And because rivers are, uh, are moving laterally, uh, because glass are recycled from old deposits, et cetera, uh, we re if we want really to apply this kind of approach, uh, we, need, um, we need to, um, to be able to trace grains, the movement of grains, over very long time scales. So now we can have a look uh, on what uh, landscape evolution model did to take into account this known locality in the transport. Um, this actually landscape evolution model uh, did include that. And in this case, for example, I show a simple example where uh, the model is uh, just 
the, the variation of uh, the, topograph the topography elevation z is simply the, it's the mass balance equation. It's minus a detachment rate plus a deposition rate. So it's illustrated in this graph here. Um, uh, you have a flux of deposition here in, 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 in green uh, that arrived to a point. And while usually E is a, a stream power lower or, or, or other or on another equations, but the important point here is that we make the simple hypothesis that the deposition rate is just a fraction of the incoming sediment flux. And for dimensional reasons, this fraction has a dimension of the reverse of a length of the transport length. And David Leg, for, ex for example, recently or more or less recently, uh, um, uh, gave an expression of uh, this transport length depending on water discharge in, in case of saltation, for example. So the non locality arises uh, when this transport length or deposition length is very long, in particular, if it's longer than the river. Uh, length, it's very uh, strongly non-local. And in terms of consequences of this kind of model on the, on the propagation of a sediment pulse, you may have a look at the recent uh, Jean Brun's paper submitted in, to, to ESERF. Uh, so the problem is uh, we don't know exactly what this parameter is. It's even difficult to define it precisely physically. It might correspond to an average of the mean transport distances uh, over some time period of, of grains, uh, but, but it's difficult to, to quantify this, this parameter and to link it to the statistics of grains transport. I think a significant step in, uh, was achieved by a recent geology paper by Laure Gate, and where she, she showed that in case of uh, dynamic equilibrium steady states, uh, and if we assume that uh, the detachment rate is a, is a stream to wallow, then we can estimate this transport length uh, based on the slope of the river and alluvial fan here. And analyzing different metal system, uh, we concluded that uh, they tend to be transport limited, so quite weakly non-local. But still, uh, we really need uh, uh, to, to be able, to, if you want to apply the same approach as done in statistical physics for river, for recent river dynamic, we, we need to, uh, we need to, we need methods to trace grains over a long time periods. So I'm, I'm going to, uh, to begin with the, the results we, we obtained um, using uh, 10 beryllium in, in individual pebbles. Uh, and in that case, uh, 10 beryllium is a kind of, of painting uh, of, of, of pebbles, uh, but painting that allows us to, to follow the gravel over, over millennia. So the basic idea, um, we, we published that with Vincent Regard uh, 10 years ago. The idea was that uh, when you have a pebble in a hill slope, it will accumulate uh, cosmogenic nuclides by interaction by cosmic rays. And if, if you want to, to know more about that, I recommend you to watch the Dick Scherer previous uh, speech, who explained that very well and in detail. And so the temperium is an isotope uh, that is created within quartz uh, in that grains. And if the, then if the transport of these uh, grains or pebbles is, is slow enough, can imagine that because the production continue, uh, that the concentration in temperium within uh, the pebble will increase the time. This is what is indicated in this diagram here where you have temperium concentration versus downstream distance. Diamonds here correspond to a mean, a mean of, of, of uh, different uh, grains taken at some distance. And each uh, square here corresponds to an individual measurement of 10 beryllium in one pebble. And so uh, based on this numerical modeling, uh, we, we, we predicted that uh, there were some situations, uh, some favorable situations where we could observe an increase of the mean and an increase of the variability of the concentration that may uh, give us information about the, the downstream spreading of trends in, in such a system, of pebbles at least. For that, uh, obviously, we, we need particular conditions. Uh, and in particular, we need uh, a localized source 
of, of, uh, of this pebble and some lithology that we could recognize when gathering pebbles downstream. So we, we've, because I'm, I've been, we've been working in, uh, in the Andes and Chile in particular for many years, we found this place in, the, in northern Chile. Um, and um, so here uh, we have a, a canyon inside in the, the Andes, uh, uh, the Western Andes, and we have an erosion window here exhuming a Paleozoic uh, source of rock and from which we, we were able to select uh, pebbles downstream. And so we, we selected uh, different pebbles at different river stations. The river is about 60 kilometer uh, long and, and terminates uh, as an alluvial fan. And this is how it looks uh, near the source. Uh, so it's looking toward the south. Uh, the Andes are to the left. Uh, so you have the erosion window here with paleozoic rocks, which is progressively, progressively exhumed by a thrust beneath. And then the canyon here incises into an oligo sediment cover. So the class we can uh, gather downstream comes from, from here. And downstream near the, the outlet, uh, the, the canyon looks like this, so it's much less incised. It's about 100 uh, meters wide. And it's an ephemeral uh, stream, so there are water during uh, some period of the year, and in particular during uh, El Nino uh, periods. So we, we sample um, um, the, the coarsest fraction we, we could find, because this is what our model uh, suggested if we wanted to have a, a good signal uh, to see the sediment transport. So we, we took the, the biggest we, we could. Um, and uh, so this is close to the source, uh, they are quite angular. And then a, a bit uh, later, 30 kilometers downstream, uh, we, we see that the, the pebbles are much rounded, which uh, indicates so uh, fluvial transport. And, and finally, we were able only to find small pebbles um, at, the last, at the last point, uh, just at the oak plate. And so we sampled what we could sample, in, in that case, only small pebbles. And so these are the results. Um, so in this diagram, you have the 10 barium concentration, and this is the downstream distance here from the source at zero to 60 kilometer near the river outlet, and you have um, the, the canyon here to, to, to locate uh, the point. But the diamond corresponds to an average of all the pebbles we collected at some place. It gives us a mean 10 barium concentration, and each point, red, each red point here corresponds to one measurement in one pebble. Um, and the number is uh, indicated the, the pebble we, we sampled. So the first uh, observation is that we indeed see an increase in, in the concentration. Uh, this increase in the concentration indicates that uh, pebbles spend time in the river and gives us access to an information about the transport rates of, the, of these gravels in, in the river. Uh, the second point is that, you can, as you can see here, uh, where we were able to collect only small uh, pebbles, uh, the concentration is much lower and it's significant and the uncertainty on the measurement is smaller than the diamond uh, size. So the only explanation of that is that small, smaller pebbles travel faster than the bigger one. So they accumulate less than beryllium during their transport. This is an only explanation to have a smaller um, uh, concentration here. And the third observation is that if you look at the, the vari variability of concentration, we get close to the source. And the variability we have at 30 kilometer increases, which means that some pebbles travel very fast, apparently. And so they do not accumulate in beryllium, but some other uh, some others uh, accumulate ten beryllium, so they stay longer in, in the in the in the river. So um, we have a measurable uh, effect of transport. Smaller pebbles go faster, and the the very the standard deviation of, of beryllium ten increases downstream, which suggests we can uh, have information about the spreading of of these grains downstream. So to go a bit further, we and, and try to convert that into um, into residence time or, or transport distances. We we used uh, 
a simple uh, single grain uh, 10 beryllium model based on what we proposed uh, 10 years with Vincent. And this model has two components, uh, a high slope model corresponding to landslide model calibrated on the, on the beryllium data we had closed from the source. And the second component that, that corresponds to a transport of grains at a constant velocity for one grain, a constant virtual velocity, so including period at rest and period in, uh, of movements. Um, and during this, uh, there is this movement, uh, grains can uh, accum accumulate 10 beryllium or, or lose beryllium because it's a radioactive uh, isotope. And so to to, to the law used to define the, the transport velocity um, is based on has two components too. The first one is the, uh, dependence on the, on the grain size, D here. Uh, and so the, the virtual velocity is a non-linear relationship depending on D, the grain size. And this law in particular, this exponent here, um, we, we, we took that from uh, empirical data published by Church and Hassan and Hassan and Bradley in, in, in a very uh, cool book to read, um, where they, 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 they found that in many rivers for, for one flood, the travel distance, uh, the, the normalized travel distance scales non-linearly with the grain size. Uh, uh, well, and so we, we used that just in the model. And then the, the, the game was to, to try to find uh, a distribution of velocity from a, from a pebble to another that could fit our, our data. Right? So we, 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 tried, we tried a lot of distribution and, and before uh, telling you which distribution seems to, to fit our data, I will show the fit itself. So this is the, the result of the modeling. So we use a more classical Monte Carlo approach uh, with a, a lot of pebbles and a lot of models and we, we, we tried a lot of distributions and a lot of grain size, initial, initial grain size, et cetera. And so here you have the mean concentration, again, the distance downstream and the diamond correspond to the data and the gray lines correspond to the model and correspond to the model that fits, uh, that, that, with the, that can't be excluded. And so they, they fit within a 99% confidence interval. And as you can see, the fit is quite good, even for the, the downstream, the more downstream, the more distal uh, pebbles that have a lower concentration and which are smaller than the, the pebbles uh, gathered upstream. Um, these models, the same models also explain well the distribution of uh, the concentration we have at 30 kilometers. And so the data correspond to the red line and the gray line correspond to the model. Again, the fit is quite good. So how can we, uh, what kind of PDF did, you, did we uh, use to model that? Well, it, it turns out that uh, to be able to fit our data, um, we, we found a solution. We, we do not claim this is the only solution, but we, we didn't find another solution uh, than uh, using a, a, a power law distribution, a Pareto law with a, with a power law tail for the distribution of, of virtual velocity. And I'm, I'm talking about really the distribution of the difference between a velocity from a pebble to another. Remember that the velocity is constant for one pebble downstream. And so the, 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 the good fit models corresponds to uh, uh, an exponent here of minus two up to uh, minus 0.6. And graphically, this PDF uh, indicates uh, a long to power tail, which means that you have a significant probability to have large transport rate, which is not a surprise in this arid uh, canyon where we can imagine that uh, uh, pebbles are transported uh, quite far during uh, intense uh, floods. And we, we can also uh, estimate the, the minimum velocity, uh, minimum uh, mean velocity at about one meter per year. So um, this, this result, so there, there's something that uh, we, we were quite uh, surprised uh, that uh, using the same uh, or adapting the same uh, velocity size relationship uh, calibrated using very short experiments, very short observations in, in river, uh, where this relationship were able to fit our data. And, and this is even uh, 
better because if we change here this exponent, it has a strong impact on the fit. And if we if we take 1.2 or 1 or 2, uh, we, we, we are unable to fit the concentration of the smaller bubble. So this is uh, probably uh, because uh, this, uh, this um, dependence on the size is linked to the processes of transporting. So it's, li it's, it's, it's linked somehow to the statistics of uh, drains movement, so when, when, when they move. So what we can do now is um, we, we can do a forward model uh, using the best fit uh, model. Uh, so it corresponds to a PDF of uh, with a, a, a long um, a long tail here, and we can start with the uh, uh, an initial population of uh, of pebbles and see how they spread spread downstream. And this is what you can see here. So if you, 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 you the histogram, the frequency of, of pebbles and the downstream distance at different time steps. And so you see at the beginning that uh, there are some uh, grains traveling very fast up to the river outlet. And, but even after several uh, tens of thousand years, you have still some grains remaining in the, in the river. And so it means the spreading is, is quite, it's quite, it's quite large uh, concerning the, the pebbles. So are we able to, to discuss if it's anomalous diffusion or, or, or pure diffusion? So for that, we have to plot the standard deviation of the distances between grains. And if you do that, so this is standard deviation here, uh, as if you remember by introduction uh, across time in, in log log plot. And what we can see is a line of slope one, and it means that the standard deviation scales with time. This means uh, super diffusion. So our results are consistent with super diffusion. But, but be careful, because uh, this super diffusion behavior is imposed by the constant velocity we, we imposed in the model for each pebbles. And it's unavoidable to have super diffusion if you, if you impose a, a constant velocity. We do not exactly, strictly speaking, we do not model a random walk uh, process with period at rest and period uh, and period of movement. So again, it's our data are consistent with super diffusion, but we have to be cautious and we probably need much more data and other other context to to, to confirm that. Uh, anyway, uh, the, this uh, anomalous diffusion probably comes also from the fact that you have uh, grains staying a long time in the river, which imposes quite a large spreading uh, of, uh, of grains distances. And again, it's illustrated here, uh, you have the, uh, the frequency of, uh, of the residence time defined as the time spent by uh, um, a pebble in the river, so the time it takes for a grain from the source to the outlet. And it is the, the distribution predicted by the best fit model uh, we, we could uh, estimate from our data. And again, what you can see is that this is a distribution with a long tail, and you have some uh, probability to have grains staying a long time in, in the system. Uh, this is not the only, um, there's very few data uh, about such, uh, um, such phenomena. This is not the only, you have also uh, uh, evidence in the, in the recent paper of uh, Sinclair et al. Uh, in, in the Great Plains in US. So how can we, um, although we, we use a virtual velocity, which include period at rest and period of movement, I think we, we can interpret our results in terms of both states uh, for, for grains. I think the fact that we, uh, we our data are very consistent with a, a short term relationship or a relationship estimated using very short term measurements uh, means that it corresponds to the um, the phenomena of of uh, grain of of, of, of uh, transport. It, it really describes probably uh, the dependence, the mean dependence that the transport length um, has with a, tr uh, a grain size. And probably the, the long tail of the probability distribution for uh, virtual velocity comes from the long uh, tail of uh, or heavy tail distribution of resting times 
it means that uh, when a, a gravel is left apart uh, in, in, a, in a sediment, uh, uh, it, it will stay here bur buried or, or not at the surface, and then it will be re-eroded when the, the, the river uh, shifts uh, slowly, uh, laterally, or, or during a large uh, flood, uh, for example, during a Niño Niño period. And it seems that time of, of uh, during which last do not move uh, follow a, a Puolo uh, relationship, which is quite consistent with a short term experiment or flume experiment of uh, evidence recently. So because I'm, I'm talking about a uh, lot about grains not moving, I will illustrate um, their influence on the, the mean residence time of sediments at, at, the, at a larger scale, at Piemont scale. So I, 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 I will use a numerical model for, for that. And so the, we, we did a simple experiment. We, we, we used a landscape evolution model based on this uh, erosion deposition formalism with, with a, a transport uh, distance. And um, we imposed um, an uplift uh, area here, which is uplifting at a constant rate. And initially it's all flat. There is no subsidence here. And so uh, sediment are eroded from here, deposited in that part. So I will let, uh, show you uh, the, the movie. So you, as you can see, rivers develop rapidly and then you get quite, uh, you have a, a steady stage corresponding to a dynamic equilibrium. And uh, during that stage, uh, erosion in average uh, is equal to the uplift rate. And in the Piedmont, uh, it behaves as a bypass, which means that the sediment flux going out from the mountain is equal to the sediment flux in average going out from, from the mountain, from the basin. So this is probably the worst situation for grains to stay a long time in the, in the, in the, in the Piedmont, in the basin, because once they enter the basin, it's they're supposed to, to leave it very quickly because we are at, at equilibrium. So what we did is uh, we, we had uh, recently, uh, the possibility in our, in our uh, model to have uh, passive grains uh, that move consistently using small probabilities uh, or simple probabilities, depending on uh, the erosion and deposition flux calculated on each pixel by the model. So there is consistency between this uh, probability of movement and, and the, the mean flux description of the topographical evolution. And so we, we um, during the equilibrium, we put a lot of grains in the mountain and we, we looked at uh, their transport in the, in the basin. And what occurs is indeed, you have most of the grain uh, leaving uh, the, the basin very rapidly in some time steps. But still, um, there are some grains remaining in the, in the, Piem in the Piemont for, for a long time. And these, these grains are or either buried a bit, buried a bit uh, in, in the sediments that were deposited at, uh, or, or they are at um, highs, uh, at topographic highs, uh, so their probability to be reloaded is smaller. And they can stay tens of thousands of years in, in, the, in the Piemont be, be, before being exported. And we, we found, analyzing the distribution of residence time and the mean residence time, we found that these grains, even if there is, there are a small minority of, of grains, control the mean residence time of all the population of grains in, in the basin. And if, you, if you have a, a geochemical way of quantifying the mean residence time, it will be, uh, it will be uh, overestimated uh, of one or two order of magnitudes. Um, if we consider that it does not represent, or in other words, it does not represent uh, the mean residence times of uh, more than 80% of, of grains, the, because these grains contaminate in somehow the, the mean residence times that can be uh, uh, quantified. And you have also, uh, um, so this is a larger scale, but you have evidence also from that paper uh, corresponding to measuring uh, system. So, um, Considering the difficulty and the complexity of, uh, of measuring and documenting the grain transport in, in, a, in a river that physicists can do very well, uh, it's almost a joke, but I, I wonder if we should spend more time in analyzing the, the, the time spent 
by grains without moving in, in the landscape and in basin in general. And I think uh, because it seems to control a lot uh, all, the, all these dynamics. So um, I will terminate by giving some suggestions about how can we in the future uh, try to link um, uh, what we could measure on the field and, and these long-term models we, we need uh, to, to, to better understand the sedimentary archives in, in basins. One approach maybe could be uh, a trial and error approach uh, using uh, such kind of uh, landscape evolution model coupling a, a, a continuous description of the topographical evolution and grains. And to illustrate that, uh, I show you two, two simple simulations. Uh, where grains are exhumed here from a, a unique point, and then they, they go downstream uh, over an inclined plane here. The blue color here corresponds to water discharge, so it's a, it's a dry transport, it's a it's transport driven by water here. And they, they look quite the same, but if you look at the standard deviation here uh, through time, the same diagram we have been using uh, before, uh, you see a uh, convex uh, evolution that resemble a diffusion evolution for, for the standard deviation in that case, where it has, in that case, it corresponds to concave up evolution. And the difference between uh, the model ingredients here is that we, we used uh, different geomorphic, geomorphic uh, transport laws in, in both cases. In that case, it is the, the now classical nonlinear uh, diffusion model popularized by Roaring. Uh, only recast here uh, in terms of erosion deposition uh, uh, formalism. And in that case, it's uh, the river uh, model proposed by Devier and Anglac. So um, if we are able to document uh, in some specific case, some specific field case, the long-term evolution, the long-term dispersion of, of a grain from a source and trying to fit this, the, the form of this curve with different geomorphic transport law, it may help. It will be probably much less clean than the statistical physics uh, done by uh, the paper I have cited, but, but still it could be very useful. Uh, another point, I think, uh, is to use not only one uh, isotope, not one cosmogenic isotope, but different cosmogenic isotopes, in particular uh, the one with uh, um, the radioactive ones, because uh, the ratio may indicate uh, a period at rest when they are buried in particular. And this could allow, uh, uh, this could allow us to tackle this problem of burial. And so that's why we, we have recently, uh, a student, Yusuf, has re recently uh, implemented that in, in SID, uh, our landscape evolution model, uh, to, to analyze um, uh, the cool evolution of this concentration uh, in different situations from a river, uh, river at river scale at a straight year and a larger scale too. And I will terminate my, my talk with something I find very promising. This is actually the work of a PhD student in, in, in Toulouse, Anne, yes, um, under the supervision of Stefan, uh, Tony Raman, and, and Jakob Wodinga. Um, she's using OSLA. Uh, o OS, OSL, sorry, uh, to document uh, sediment transport uh, in, uh, in rivers in, in New Zealand. And I'm not going to spoil her data. Uh, she, she has very nice data, but I will just show the model she's doing to, to better uh, understand her, her data. So in, in uh, her model, she, she did better than we did uh, with the 10 beryllium because she's separating a period at rest uh, and period where plast move um, downstream. And so she, she starts with the grains, uh, saturated grains um, in, in the bedrock. And then uh, these grains are moved randomly uh, with some distribution of transport length, characterized in that case by a mean transport length that could be somehow related by the transport length uh, I showed you in the landscape evolution model, maybe. And uh, so there are also a distribution for uh, resting times and uh, grains uh, are bleached when they are at the surface or they accumulate those when they are at depth. So she, she did uh, Monte Carlo uh, uh, simulations. And I will show you only one, one result. Uh, so this is a simulation where uh, from the source here 
to the river outlet. It's 200 kilometers, uh, corresponding to one of uh, her river. And, and she, she puts a lot of grain at once, bedrock source, and she analyzes one signal of the single uh, grain OSL. And you can get different type of signal with that. But in that case, it's only the percentage of the saturated grains. And she, so she simulates uh, this signal using a mean transport distance of five kilometers up to 30 kilometers. And as you can see, the signal you can predict is, is very different. And this is something that can be measured, can be discriminated using uh, data. And it suggests that we may be able, in particular, if we couple this with uh, other uh, trusses like uh, beryllium 10 or so on, we may uh, more and more be able to constrain uh, not only the transport, but also the period at rest and, and, and make this link between the long term dispersion of grains and the uh, long term landscape evolution models. So I terminate my, my key points. Are, uh, it seems that our data in, in Chile are consistent with a, a nomadous diffusion. This is maybe the, the first evidence uh, over long time scales. Um, it's cool to see that uh, nature is quite simple because the same size velocity relationship seems to hold over a long time scale, uh, even if there is a large variability of the transport distances for a given size. Um, we probably need a better documentation of the distribution of, um, of, of a period at rest for grains of different sizes. And, and also we, we, we need uh, to develop methods and, and coupled methods uh, of between geochemistry and, and, and numerical modeling to, to track grains over long time scales. I think this is my, um, my conclusion. And thank you very much for, for your attention. And I'm open for any question. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian. <clears throat> Sorry for this uh, great uh, talk. Uh, so the chat is open for questions, so do not hesitate to, uh, to write it down if you have a, a question or, or a comment. Um, I will maybe start with uh, maybe a silly question. Sorry, uh, Sebastian, if I did not get that. Um, in the uh, cosmogenic part of your talk, I think for the second part, um, how do you take into account the uh, fragmentation of grains uh, during transport? Hmm. Well, in, in the model, we, we, we didn't. Uh... The, 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 we, 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 did, um, we did test the effect of attrition. And uh, so the, the, the progressive diminution of the size downstream does no measurable effect on, on the, the parameter we could, uh, could estimate. So we, we, don't, we don't discard the fact that there is, but there's no influence on the signal. And, and if, 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 um, if uh, pebbles break, um, then obviously you have a, a more complicated system, but it does not change the fact that at the end, if you have grains with a smaller concentration, uh, the only possibility is, they, is because they traveled uh, more rapidly. And even if they're from the, the splits of, of two grains, uh, it means that they traveled more rapidly, faster. Okay, and I think I have a second one and then I will maybe uh, uh, let the room for other questions. Um, I, I was wondering for this uh, size velocity uh, relationship, uh, what, what is the limit and how do you account for the effect of, uh, of threshold for motions for the grains? Because I can imagine that um, uh, you, I mean, the catchment you are studying are not limited only to a, a typical flood event, that you have a, a series of flood events that will lead to a, a various, uh, uh, let's say, tangential stress at the bottom of, of the river, how will you account for this distribution of, of uh, events uh, and for uh, the fact that there is a threshold for motion in this uh, size velocity relationship? Oh, I think this is a question for, for uh, George, Hassan, and Bradley, and so on. But basically, um, I do not take that into account. You, you, uh, the model is very simple. I just have a mean velocity. So the mean velocity includes periods at rest and period of movement. And over a time period, we, we don't know exactly. We, we assume that you have a, a virtual velocity. And it's the same in, in the analysis of done in, in the field to, to get the, to, to establish this empirical, uh, empirical um, uh, relationship uh, in when you track grains, uh, there are grains not moving and other moving and you have a statistics of a transport distance. 
and, and you just look at, the, at that. Okay, thanks. So I see there is a question uh, by uh, Dean Flag. Uh, so he's saying, I said, great uh, talk. What about linking the PDF of daily discharge and the long-term PDF of mean grain velocities? Uh, yeah, if we could, um, yeah, yeah, obviously, um, uh, if we have, if we want to have a complete description of uh, all the behavior of grains and, and be able to link that with uh, an, an, a simplified uh, law, a geometric transport law, we, we have to compare that with any other data we can have, in particular the distribution of uh, water discharge. Um, as it's, it has to be to be done. I, I think, as, as you can, I, I can add um, a bemol to. Uh, I can add a, um, in, the, in the model I did. Uh, there is an hypothesis of stationarity of this process of uh, producing uh, grains on the hill slope and transferring them. And it, it's, it's debatable, even if there are ex examples published of this uh, stationarity in, in, in Peru by Mike Phillips in the Nature Science paper. So yes, um, um, yeah, we have to do that. Yeah. I don't know, Boris, or the you have any question? Uh, yeah, I have a, a small question. What, uh, when you were talking about residence time, what kind of range did you consider for the grain size? I was wondering, I'm asking because if you have long residence time for smaller grain size, that could also affect um, the measurements of phase in of rate, erosion rate when we take really small grain of size. Yeah. Size of grain. Uh, so obviously the data we have uh, are for from big pebbles, as, as you could say. Um, apparently, even if there is this uh, non-linear size uh, transport relationship, um, it's an average, so you have a large variability for given blast. And in terms of um, in terms of uh, catchment erosion rate, for example, deduced from uh, from, from uh, pebbles of, of sand, we, we have uh, many evidences that you, you don't get the same concentration in the average. Uh, I tend to well, um, Stefi know, know that very well too, and. There are many uh, documentations of, of that about the world. I think uh, big pebbles may probably uh, give us uh, uh, the, the, the mean erosion rates uh, by landslides, probably. I didn't mention that, but um, the, if we calculate the mean erosion rate, the mean catchment erosion rate using the, the distribution we have near the source, we have the highest erosion rate measured in Chile open uh, six millimeter per year and this is well it's a seismic area with very high slopes it's full of debris flow and, 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 and landslides but still uh, this is very high compared to other uh, estimates we have in, in Atacama and I think it's because it, it, uh, it gives you um, something different from from the sand Yeah, I would um, also have a couple of questions. So first, um, I mean, you're looking at very long timescales now, obviously, but there's also data on shorter timescales, for example, where individual pebbles have been tagged and, and people have looked at how far do they travel in a certain amount of time. So have you ever compared your data to these uh, short-term data? And does it somehow agree in, in like, let's say, mean distance? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, travel distance, for example? I missed the beginning of your question. Sorry, there, there was um, some small cut. If you have um, ever compared your long-term data that, or maybe also your model results with these short-term data that exist where people have tracked or tagged pebbles yeah. and, and got also some rates or transport distances. No, but it, it's really, uh, it would be a nice project because it, in, in this Atacama River, we have no data in particular it would be difficult because uh, because of the distribution of fluid and, and, and because this is an arid uh, area. But clearly, where there are data of uh, short-term transport, it would be very cool to, to be able to do that. If you have um, a given lithological source, yeah, you can you can recognize in the pebble you will, you will sample downstream. 
And, and the other point you, you could do, the other thing you could do is try to, to model that. Uh, the, the, the first uh, way I suggested, uh, for example, uh, taking the, the data published by Bradley and in, in several years ago would be probably useful to try to, to model that uh, distribution and, and testing different uh, geomorphological, geomorphic transport laws. Mm. Mm -hmm. And my other question would be way more general, I guess. So in the very beginning, you were showing this figure. I think it actually was the very first slide um, from source to sink and that we are interested in kind of signal propagation, that we, we look at the amount of sediment that gets discharged or grain size distribution or some mineralogy or chemical composition of the sediment. And now in your talk, you basically show that certain grains have really long re residence times and you have this heavy tail distribution. So what do you think is the impact of that on signal propagation or what does it mean for how reliable we can reconstruct information from sedimentary deposits? So do you think this really like yeah, messes yeah. up everything or do you no, think no, 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 there's no, still hope? No, no, yeah, it's, no yeah, I think uh, no, there also, wait, there's always hope, <laughs> no, but, but uh, uh, no, no, it's, these grains are very small number of grains, actually. They, they, they do not participate a lot to the global sediment flux. So it's, it's more, if we, if we try to, uh, they, they can contaminate or pollute, I, I don't know how to say, the signal, the geochemistry signal you can infer from, 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 from a strata, for example, in the sedimentary basin. So we have to be cautious with that. But, but this recycling problem is very well known by the, sedimentary, the sedimentologists for, for a long time. It's just maybe not so much the well, I mean, for me, it was a quite a surprise. And, and um, but still, if we, uh, but still, the, the distribution of period at rest is clearly one component of, of this uh, of this transfer. And, 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 and I think <clears throat> probably it seems that it's, it's very important in determining if it's uh, diffusion or in the mellow diffusion. And it may, it might be at the end, it might be just just an academic problem with no real implication for sedimentological problem. But if we want really to, to test the laws we've been using for, for years, uh, I think a, a good way is to try to, to do as do the physicists uh, linking these uh, statistics of grain movement and the geomorphic trans transport laws. Yeah, well, thanks. And then I actually would have one last question and then I promise <laughs> I, I'm done. So you were kind of saying also in your conclusions that we need to understand better what happens during the times when the when sediment is at rest. So when it sits in floodplains, for example. Um, and then on the other hand, while the sediment sits there, there's now more and more work showing that this is also when lots of processes are happening, like when, when there's lots of weathering happening, um, oxidation and so on. And of course, all these processes would again affect your parameter that you are measuring. So in this case, 10 beryllium or, or maybe the OSL um, approach from, from the PhD study you were showing in the end. So do you think this time at rest that there is the potential that, that the parameters get modified so much that it might be a problem to actually track them through time properly? Uh, oh yeah. No, about the 10 beryllium signal, it has no, no, no effect. Even uh, well, the, the effect you can have, for example, if you walk on, on, the, on these rivers, uh, in particular in Atacama or in many places, you can see these boulders destroyed uh, by weathering because they, they have been seated here for, for many, for a long time. So you just convert a pebble into, into sand and, it's, and you, you, you come back to the problem of a mixture of grain sizes. But the signal is here, so see for a pebble, even if it's weathered, uh, when you get it, uh, it contains the, the cosmogenic signal and the same for OSL in, in FEDSPAT or in the case of uh, the work done by, by Anne. Um, about OSL, uh, the, the effect of weathering, I, I, would, I would not claim nothing because I'm not a specialist. Uh, but uh, but no, I think it's it, this is exactly what we want to. This is a good way, a good method, I think, because this is what we want to to, to get uh, an information about this time, this residence time, and in uh, at least for cosmogenic nuclides, it has, it has no. Uh, well, and obviously, um, it depends on the on the crystals uh, exactly you are using, 
and, and the kind of isotopes you, you, are, you are measuring. I mean, I'm talking about tin beryllium, so in quartz, for example, it's very stable. So. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I, if I answered your question. Yeah, yeah, I think you did. I, I was just thinking about, yeah, if, if you're particularly measuring pebbles, for example, and they sit in floodplains for a really long time and just get weathered and disappear, like yeah. the next time you go there, you don't sample them anymore, right? So you only sample those ones that are still there, but not those ones that have maybe been sitting there for so long that they have reduced yeah. in size, let's say. So Sure. So. Well, okay. But yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Sebastian. I don't see uh, any other question in the chat. Uh, so if someone has a question to ask, it's really uh, high time that you ask it. I don't see anything. Uh, so if there is no more question, I will thank you once again, Sebastian, for this uh, really great talk. And um, this is also the last uh, talk of uh, this year. And we will try to, uh, to organize a new set of uh, new series sorry, of uh, of talks for uh, early next week. Um, and as I, or, as I have already said, don't hesitate to, uh, to suggest some speakers, or if you are motivated to uh, contribute to uh, uh, Landscape Live, please also uh, uh, contact us. So thanks again, Sebastian, and, uh, and see you. Thank you. Thanks for you. And thank you for organizing this. Thank you. Thanks right. a lot.